your life, Magda. Good afternoon, good evening, perhaps even good morning if there's anyone out there from Australia. We're so happy to be live again on Facebook. I'm Magda Bobian, the director and founder of Under the Volcano. And tonight is the fourth of our Taking the Conversation Home events in which we're featuring alumni and faculty of our program. Under the Volcano has been convening since 2003 every January in the village of Tepoztlan, just south of Mexico City in the foothills of the Great Volcanoes, where we uh, hold master classes for writers from around the world. And we'll be meeting next January, not there, but as a virtual community of the imagination. We welcome you now to that community. I'll say a little bit more about it later in the program. For now, what I want to be sure to say, for those of you joining us on Facebook Live, is that we'll be opening up for a Q&A around a quarter after the hour, and you'll be able to submit questions in the chat below the video space on Facebook. We look forward to taking your questions for either of our guests tonight or for both of them. I want to welcome now Elizabeth Rosner and Debbie Lasker, introducing them each with a few words from their impressive bios and moving quickly into a conversation about their work, why I've brought them together in a single conversation, um, in which there's a role of serendipity and coincidence, but also some planning. And, uh, and then leave the floor open for them to uh, share their thoughts and also read from their work. So Davi Lasker, um, whom I've known for many years, she was actually my student in the MFA program at Columbia, where she arrived after receiving a journalism degree as an undergraduate and working as a reporter, um, is a native of Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Her book, her novel, The Atlas of Reds and Blues, was the winner of the Asian Pacific American Award for Literature and the Crook's Corner Book Prize. Doesn't read like it, but it's her first novel. Uh, it's won a number of prizes since it appeared in 2019 and is now available in paperback. I encourage you all to read it if you haven't already, and you can click your way to a link to purchase it if you go to her website which is, of course, DeviLaskar.com. Um, the Atlas of Reds and Blues was named by the Washington Post as one of the best books of 2019 and has received actually rave reviews across the English-speaking world. Um, Devi is not just a novelist or just a journalist. She's also a poet with a chapbook to her name. She's a prolific photographer, essayist, and also painter, though she doesn't say that in her bio. I happen to know it. She's living in the San Francisco Bay Area with her family and has been to Under the Volcanoes master classes three times in both poetry and fiction. Elizabeth Rossner is also familiar to those of you who've uh, been in her workshops at Under the Volcano and elsewhere. She's a novelist, poet, and essayist originally from Rochester, New York but based in Berkeley, California for years now. So we have with us two transplanted uh, Californians or transplantees to California. They're both California writers at this point. Elizabeth's first book of nonfiction, which we'll be talking about, especially tonight, Survivor Cafe, The Legacy of Trauma and the Labyrinth of Memory, was published in September of 2017, featured in NPR's All Things Considered and in the New York Times named one of the best books of that year by the San Francisco Chronicle, for which she often writes and reviews. She's the author of three novels, a poetry collection, and um, it bears saying that her third novel uh, was listed for the prestigious Prix Femina in France, won also France's Prix France Bleu Gironde, the Great Lakes Colleges Award, and Hadassah Magazine's Ribolo Prize, for which the judge was none other than Elie Wiesel, whose name will arise a little further on. Um, Elizabeth also writes essays and publishes poems in the New York Times Magazine, in Elle, in The Forward, and has been in numerous anthologies. 
I'm pleased to say that she'll be returning next January to lead our Words of Witness Masterclass for writers of memoir and literary nonfiction. So a warm welcome to both Elizabeth Rossner and Debbie Lasker. One of the pleasures of being the moderator is that I get to ask not all, but at least some of the questions that I'm sure are on other people's minds. So um, I think one of the most striking things, and I'm talking about rereading here because I re read both of their books before, and this might be the cue for us to hold up uh, covers of these books. I don't know if, if we have behind the scenes images, but I can certainly do this myself I have them right here. I've reread after reading a couple of years ago with most huge pleasure, both of these books. And um, one of the things that strikes, especially now on rereading, is the ways in which both Liz and Debbie, coming out of very different backgrounds, have in these works made a very strong, explicit choice to not forget, um, not to forget what, trauma, which is in the title of Liz's book, uh, searing experiences that both of them survived. Liz, as the daughter of Holocaust survivors, both her parents having been in concentration camps as teenagers, making a new life in this country and belonging, as she puts it, to generation three, which she may mention. And Debbie, as someone whose entire family was subjected to a harrowing ordeal that caused them literally to move halfway across the country or two thirds across the country, their own country, it bears saying, to escape their tormentors. Though the stories have different points of departure, they share this powerful impulse to record and to remember to not choose amnesia. As Elie Wiesel, the author of Night, one of the early books to emerge from the Holocaust and quoted by Liz partway through her book, made his own explicit choice after 10 years of silence. What's striking to me now, also having you both here, is that I actually had no idea you knew each other, even though I knew both of you, until I read the acknowledgments in Debbie's novel. So the first question I want to ask is the most obvious. How do you two know each other anyway? Who would like to go first? I'll go first. I want to say thank you. Uh, it turns out that you, uh, Magda and Liz, have something else in common. You're both my teachers. So this is a fabulous treat for me. <laughs> um, I, um, I met Liz uh, through uh, your other student, uh, Elizabeth Stark. And actually the first time I saw her was in Mexico. Um, many years ago, she was giving a reading at a poetry festival in Mexico. And I only knew her by, um, by email at that point. And then I got to meet her live in person in Mexico. And then a couple of years later, um, we were reintroduced at a workshop and then we've been good friends ever since. Yeah, I, you know, there really are so many wonderful intersections in our in our trio with with you, Magda, um, that I get to know Magda because of Devi. Devi handed Magda Survivor Cafe, I, I gather, while she was rushing off to the airport after leaving a session of Under the Volcano. And the next thing I knew, Magda was reaching out to me asking if I might be interested in, in teaching at Under the Volcano, which my answer was immediately yes before I knew any of the details I was already saying yes and so there's this great link of um, New York California Tepoztlan San Miguel de Allende you know all, all the kind of bicultural interconnections that make under the volcano such a magical place and Tepoztlan in particular but I think truly our connections aside from geography and and appreciation for each other also as Magda alluded to, go deeply into the place of our literary endeavors and where, where we straddle the worlds between poetry and prose, mm -hmm. where, we, where we build our, our narratives out of some interweaving of fact and and fiction or the imagination at least, and, and this belief that 
that the stories that we have to tell aren't always easy to tell and therefore require you know this engagement of of heart and mind you know as writers and i think that that's something that i i so respect and admire in devi's in devi's book in which i just can't recommend highly enough it's it's gorgeous on the page i mean it's it's an absolutely lyrically crafted piece of writing and it also doesn't shy away from difficult subjects and the concepts of racial violence, racial injustice, um, dehumanization, the inability of certain people to see one another as individuals rather than as members of some kind of group or other. You know, all of those themes that we're wrestling with right now in the United States um, and need to keep wrestling with because clearly, historically, we haven't done a good job of it. You know, Debbie is managing to do that in a novel that is also just exquisitely pleasurable to read for the quality of the writing. Oh, thank you. Well, I have to say that I've been a longtime fan of Liz and um, I knew her first as a poet. So um, I, I read Gravity a, a long time ago and I was, uh, I was just blown away. And then I ran out and tried to find all of her other books. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, uh, I just really enjoyed watching her career and watching her develop as, uh, her, as a writer. And I really feel like with Survivor Cafe, she married two of her strengths, um, which is this really keen observation of, of the world and then the gorgeous language, right, mm -hmm. with which she is talented. And so she was able to produce this really amazing book. I have reread Survivor Cafe so many times and I'm still, every time I read the alphabet at the beginning of the book, I still get tears in my eyes mm -hmm. because it is that powerful and it's evergreen. It will, it, mm -hmm. it will last forever. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, this probably sounds like some kind of, you know, love fest between <laughs> me and Debbie, but you know, I, I have to also say that I think one of the things Magda, you are often able to do, maybe always able to do, is bring together people who as writers um, recognize what is resonant in one another's work and, and that we don't come to that landscape as a kind of competitive, territorial, you know, well, did you say it better or did I say it better? And, and so I feel like one of the things these conversations are giving us the chance to do is to continue to express support and appreciation for one another and to see how our work amplifies each other, you know, and how voices can amplify one another and that there isn't a kind of zero sum game when it comes to trauma, when it comes to historical collective suffering, um, you know, that there's room for all of it and that and that we can help each other by recognizing those echoes and those mirrors without feeling threatened by there isn't enough space for me to talk about my work and your work. Whereas the opposite, I think, is true. There's there's more space when we give each other room to share. Absolutely. I really appreciate the way you've put that. I mean, one of the whole notions of this idea of taking the conversation home is to keep a flow going of speculation and creativity and inspiration that of course began in Tepoztlan. It began a few years ago as I began to feel an ever growing urgency about making sure that writers connect across all of our work. So we have journalists in the program, we have poets, we have novelists, we have people writing works of nonfiction and shorter texts and now newspaper columns. I mean, anything that uses words. And I think you're totally right that, I mean, there's room for all of our voices and they're more necessary than ever, which is why we're pretty often using the hashtag words matter. I mean, I don't know what else writers can do except keep on writing. But um, one of the things that is so striking to me, again, on rereading both of your books, as it was the first time around, um, is the generosity of your, uh, the way that you actually spun out the writing. That is, 
Elizabeth's story, which is the story of repeated returns to Germany with her father who survived Buchenwald, going back and literally encountering this surreal little corner in a, con in a convention hall, I believe, Liz could correct me, for returnees who had been in camps in case they needed a little revival before going into the main events. It was the Survivor Cafe where you could get some juice or some tea or some coffee and just gather your strength. I can imagine it's an amazing title for a book, but this story um, is told with growing rings around the core, almost like a tree, and that we mm -hmm. sense the empathy of reaching out across the, the years, across generations, and across genocides from a survivor or who's in, inherited the trauma of her parents, what that means, exploring those interstices, and then looking at other genocides that have happened tragically in the last 75 years, since everyone thought there would be a never again. Mm -hmm. um, and Devi, I'm curious, uh, maybe I'll just turn this into a question to you directly, uh, because I, I know the story on which your novel uh, I hate to use this word, disbased story out of which your novel grows. Um, rather than tell it like a series of facts, and you certainly have the skills to tell it as a journalist, you've created this, in fact, amazingly lyrical work in very short bursts, which becomes a page turner because you're using the devices of fiction, using flashbacks, almost the entire novel is cast um, in, in the realm of sort of, you know, Fuentes doing the death of Artemio Cruz or Faulkner as I lay dying, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if you had those models in mind, but in any case, you've created a lyrical novel rather than an account, but it's based on the rawest of experience. And you also created a character who is, becomes universal because she's called Mother. And the three daughters that I know correspond to characters in your own life are just older daughter, middle daughter, younger daughter. And so there's a way in which they come to be a kind of every family USA, which is profound. And of course, they are also, uh, you know, Indian or Bengali American or whatever you might use to describe them. But that sense that this could be any of us is very powerful, very gripping. Anyway, um, so my question is sort of like, how did you come to these structures, which are unusual, which are non-linear in both cases, and represent a departure from your prior projects? What um, were some issues that you grappled with as you tried to find the right form? And, you know, anything you could say about that, I think, would be pretty interesting for our audience. Sure. Um, um, that's a it's a good question. Um, so I, you know, I was I was a journalist for a number of years, and um, and I covered cops and courts, and so I've had many an editor over the years tell me to keep it short. And then of course I'm a poet, and so I've also had many an editor over the years trying to tell keep me keep it short. So I actually I I was trying to keep it short. I I do love. Um, I feel like the book that I'm most closely trying to emulate is um, The House on Mango Street um, hmm. because she's a poet who wrote a novel who, uh, if you look at the, all the pieces put together, form this beautiful lyrical novel. And then you take all the pieces apart and she is heavily anthologized in poetry anthologies. And so when I first started to write this story way back in 2004, you know, I was, I was writing a story that was mostly a family story and I was really trying to emulate um, uh, Sandra Cisneros and um, and then you know because of the raid and because of the things that happened to my family in 2010 um, I lost most of my work and um, and it took about four years um, for me to kind of get my words back and um, my prose back at least and then when I sat down to rewrite this book in 2014 um, I, my, I had changed as a person, but I had also changed as a writer. And so my focus was no longer on this family per se, but mostly of how this family intersects with the United States of, you know, of, of the early 21st century. 
And so um, one, of my, uh, one of my colleagues in my longstanding writing group is a screenwriter. And she introduced me to um, Aristotle's incline, which is the structure that I used for the book. And that's the um, structure that, uh, that uh, screenwriters use to write film scripts. And I thought it was appropriate for my character because she is um, lying shot on the ground. And so she doesn't have the opportunity to get up and have conversations or meaningful interactions. And so this, um, when I was introduced to this form, I was very excited because I finally found the structure that was appropriate for my character. Yeah. It's quite amazing. I mean, in the, in the, the character is basically the whole story happens in, the, in this character's mind. And I love that the book launches with Aristotle, because you almost give the reader, you know, a handle on, we're, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and um, she does it, you do it. Uh, yeah, and you know, I'm a poet too, so once, um, you know, um, once I kind of finished the first pass of this book, what I realized was that I had sort of written a pantoum and uh, where, you know, some of the themes and the lines repeat, and so, I was very excited about that too, because that's my favorite form to write in anyway. So I was like, well, then this is my chance to actually, you know, play, you know, and, but also, um, you know, say what I need to say. I have to say the book was much larger and um, I, I did cut it um, significantly. And so it, it just becomes mother's story and it, and no other, no other character in the book uh, hogs the stage. So, anything it's, you'd like to share? Would you like to read from that? Sure, sure. Wait to hear a bit in your voice. Sure. Um, okay. This is uh, from the opening pages. Um, moving day in the ordinary world, in which she moves 13 long miles to a new house. Three girls in tow, their beloved shepherd parked in a kennel, their belongings painstakingly packed box by box and hauled over from the old house bit by bit. The man of the hour, her husband, on a business trip, first France and then Japan during this entire event. They move from the boundaries of Atlanta's city limits to just inside the closing arms of suburbia. Black clouds waste no time. Heavens open up. Trees swing like pendulums, thunder fails to cease. The rain unrelenting, impassable roads under perpetual construction, strip malls decorated in neon, gated brick monstrosities and carpet soft lawns, ravines covered in kudzu, etched metal historical markers dot streets like stop signs, subtly celebrating the Confederacy 139 years after the loss commuters honking a concerto of road rage, the small glazed air they all breathe, and a pair of shop girls crossing the street when they see her coming. Mm -hmm. And that gives it to us in stereo. Mm -hmm. And so pathetic, my God. Mm -hmm. uh, let me turn to Liz for a second here. Um, how about the writing of Survivor Cafe? How on earth did it gain all those layers? What was the process? Yeah, it's so interesting when you're um, when you're holding a book in your hands as a reader and and you look at the pieces as if they always belonged where they where they fit and um, you know all the pages are numbered and the table of contents is numbered the way everything's in order and. And little do you know what goes into the, the, for me, very chaotic, very uncertain experience of breaking down, putting together, reassembling, failing to understand how it's going to ever work. Um, so there were so many things that Debbie mentioned too about um, the realization that that the shape of a book could teach her what it was, you know, that she recognized there was something pantoum like in the pages that she hadn't necessarily put there consciously, but that didn't arrive out of nowhere either. And so in my case, um, 
you know, as Magda mentioned, the, the trip part of this book, the journeys, the three journeys to Germany that this book contains, um, the third journey, the most recent one in 2015, was the one that gave rise to the title of the book and really gave rise to the book entirely because I was telling my editor about, about this experience I had with this event called Survivor Cafe. And unlike the way Magda described it, just to be a little more accurate, it was, it was a part of a commemoration itinerary for survivors that these grandchildren of Nazis had created as a way of commemorating the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Buchenwald. And they arranged for these cafe tables to be set up for survivors to sit and meet with locals who would come by and have theoretically casual informal conversations with survivors and it was it was a surreal experience and I came back telling about it not with the intention of writing about it but it was my editor who said this is your next book it's going to be called Survivor Cafe and as soon as he said that I knew that actually it was a book I'd already been writing my whole life not because I'd already been writing about being a daughter of survivors in my novels, but because I had always been thinking about, and this is, this is the place where, you know, crossing territory comes in that I mentioned earlier, because I had always been interested in the way the Holocaust didn't just differentiate me and my family from everyone else, but actually connected me with everyone else who also had some legacy of sorrow or loss or in some cases exile genocide torture violence and so the decision that i made not just to write about my family and my own inheritance but to allow that to engage my curiosity in all these directions and that the thing i like to say to people who are aspiring writers who feel themselves, you know, kind of widely attracted to a multiplicity of ideas. Don't be afraid mm -hmm. to reach far. Don't be afraid to, um, you know, shy away from that, steer away from that dictum about write what you know and be willing to write what you want to know. You know, I'm not original to that statement, but I love to repeat it, write what you want to know. And what I wanted to know was, what is it that we all carry collectively from the past, not just individuals who can trace a specific lineage to a particular historical episode or era, but how does what we all carry as human beings make us connected with one another? And how does that shared experience give us the opportunity to be more empathetic and to be more transformative in how we how we handle the present and how we move toward the future. And so what I, even though I was wrapped with fear about taking on such an epic kind of scale of material, I also in a way like Devi was trying to keep my, my text manageable in, in portions, you know? And so I was trying to write about the ginkgo tree and, and to see how that connected with a lot of other parts of the book, but also for, for some extended period of time to just study the ginkgo tree and then to just look at what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and try to wrap my head around why don't they use the word survivor to talk about people who lived through the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Why did they use the word hibakushan? What does that mean? And, and to allow myself to kind of go vertically into territory that wasn't my own but then also go horizontally and, and kind of dare to cross those thresholds in between. And to say, it's not only my history that matters to me, it's the history of enslaved African-Americans in this country. And even as a first generation American, that too is my inheritance. I live in this country on this land drenched in the blood of the genocide of Native Americans, drenched in the blood of tortured and enslaved Africans, and then lynched African Americans and Jim Crow laws. And all of those layers still shape me, even though my parents weren't part of that history, but I live in this country. And so the wrestling for me then was about 
how to make all this fit inside one binding of one book. And so one of the um, one of the things that happened when I was about two thirds of the way through the book, through writing and researching and and piling up these pages, was to kind of take the literal feeling of overwhelm and see if I could find language for my failure to do justice to this material. And I wrote this thing that I call the alphabet of inadequate language. And when I wrote that, I wasn't sure it belonged in the book until I checked in with a, a very dear friend and mentor, Susan Griffin, who wonderfully acknowledged that, oh yes, this is, I think this is the beginning of your book. Um, and, and then I realized, oh, it's like the map for the book. It's like the alternative table of contents for the book. It's like the frontispiece to yeah. the book. And so I'm just going to read you a couple of entries from it because to read the whole thing actually takes seven minutes. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to do all of that, but, um, but just to give you a few examples. The alphabet of inadequate language. A is for Auschwitz. Where more than a million were gassed and then burned into ash the word that could speak for everything that follows. A is for atrocity. A is for Armenian genocide, words that are illegal to say aloud in Turkey. A is for atom bomb. So you can see how even just with that one letter, I was allowing myself to, to stretch outside of just my territory. And, and I can tell you that, you know, even within my own family and certainly often within the Jewish community, there's a kind of nervousness about talking about the Holocaust alongside any other genocide, any other atrocity, that there's this terror, as I was alluding to earlier, that it will somehow diminish our story if it's shared, if, if any other spotlight is given to any other story. And what I have learned and, and what I have insisted upon is saying, I'm not comparing, and this isn't a hierarchy, and this isn't a competition of who suffered more and, and whose victimization is greater or more lasting. It's to say, this is the human story. This is, this is all of ours together. That's beautiful, uh, what you read. Um, again, I think the the achievement of your book, and it's an example for other writers, and that itself is an achievement, is to say there's no story too big. Mm. And if one can't name, then one does sort of the opposite of naming. One invokes what can't be said. What a, what a wonderful device you came upon. Um, and there's, I mean, I, I can't recommend either of these books more highly, but in the reread, uh, phrases jump out at me, and one, maybe because I know Spanish, is the idea of um, la teta asustada that you mentioned, which is a kind of sense of inherited grief, grief that's passed on, but that coming in Spanish, which almost to my ear sounds like Ladino, like part of a very ancient mm. uh, verse of sorrow of the Jews' expulsion from Spain. It may not be, but it sure sounds like it. La teta asustada is also the the breast that the ch that is is too uh, shocked to give milk so the baby can't drink and that is in a way the kind of loss that gets passed down and that which we share and so i feel that there's a tremendous um example here <clears throat> that you've given in which there is no competition in terms of grief in terms of genocides but uh, this is a terrible shared inheritance that we we have to grapple with I, you know, I love that you pulled that example because um, it also speaks to the embodied quality of, yeah. of what I think both Debbie and I have written about too, that, that I think both of our books have a lot of physicality in them. And, and that's partly because there are ways that the body speaks um, that, that in some ways are beyond words, but also become this, this sort of intersection between the literal and the metaphoric. And that, that phrase that you just used, Magda, that I reference is, you know, is a perfect example of how the body is, is literally acting out 
its traumatic residue that is being transmitted to the subsequent generations. So who needs a metaphor? I mean, who needs a metaphor for that? You know, like you just describe specifically what the body does and the metaphor takes care of itself. And that's saying something as a poet and, and to Devi as a poet also, who, you know, sometimes we want to use metaphor because it does a better job than, than something literal can do. But, but those examples that I try to use in the book are so cross-cultural and that's sort of the point, right? That an individual culture didn't, didn't invent this experience because no one else would understand it. It, it is something that, that ripples and reverberates everywhere. And, and I want to say that one of the things I think uh, Liz and I have in common with our books is they are, um, they hopefully will lead to conversation, right? Um, I don't think there will be any lasting change unless we have candid debate. And I feel like people will have a chance to, um, you know, perhaps read our books and have uh, or start a candid conversation. You know, um, that's that's really what I was hoping for when I, you know, wrote my book was that it would spark conversation that was not instantly devolving into attacks or defensiveness, right? Um, but you know, it's hard to talk about racism and it's hard to talk about trauma without people getting defensive or, or you know, um, or you know, upset and and so. It, it's great to come to texts that that discuss it and explore it and um, and explore issues that are hard to talk about and give people at least a starting point to to begin a candid conversation. And I think what you just said about um, you didn't use the word uncomfortable, but it was the word that I was thinking of that you know that when I when I allowed kind of in a transparent way at the beginning of my book to say, I, I don't feel like I can do justice to what I'm about to write about, even though I spent a whole book and years writing about it, to, to be willing to be awkward, to be willing to fail, to be willing to say things very imperfectly. And, um, and also then to, you know, to be transparent about that and to reflect on it publicly, visibly. You know, I remember, when I was asking Viet Nguyen to read my to read my book for a possible endorsement, and first I checked with him because I realized that in that same alphabet I said something about boat people, and I and I checked with him to make sure that was that an offensive phrase, and he said, "Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. is." And and then I had this whole kind of opportunity to rework myself and to apologize and to say, you know, I'm so glad that I asked and that I, and that I could kind of fumble that way and, and get it wrong at first and not have him shame me, but to have him educate me. And then, you know, from now on, whenever I talk about the war in Vietnam, I say the war in Vietnam. I don't say the Vietnam War because the Vietnamese call it the American War and Vietnam is that's also in the alphabet. V is for Vietnam, the name of a country. Right. It's the name of a country. It's not the name of a war. That's mm -hmm. that's something we have come to accept as normal and it's not. And then just to call people enslaved persons and not slaves, you know, we're 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 making our way through these minefields together right. and, and we're, you know the thing that we think we're doing right now, we might find out a year from now that we did it wrong, you know, and, and that we get to repair that again. And so yes. this, these conversations that Debbie is talking about have to include these feelings of kind of making it messy and, and, yeah. and being gentle with each other, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I really didn't know. And thank you for teaching me now, you know? So I want to jump in here because really we are in the midst of just such a conversation that you hope your writing would inspire. And I think we are getting a stream of questions, which is wonderful. I want to remind people listening that we will be taking questions shortly in about five more minutes um, and remind you that you're watching Taking the Conversation Home from Under the Volcano, 
a program of writing master classes that meets every January, normally in a village in Mexico, in the mountains south of Mexico City. But we will be turning into a virtual community of the imagination in January 2021. And Elizabeth Rossner will be teaching a master class for writers of nonfiction and memoir, which we're calling Writing of Witness not surprisingly and i think um, from everything that she said so far and from debbie's work also and her comments in this conversation you can see why under the volcano itself is gradually turning to that whole theme across all the genres our journalists are witnesses our poets are witnesses and we are all writing works in progress because we are works in progress and maybe this is a metaphor, but you know, we are, we all write and we revise and we polish and maybe what we write may have to be rewritten even as soon as a year from now, because we don't even know what this is that we're living through, but we find our way, we grapple and words are our medium as writers, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> choking here, I just want to remind people again, we're taking applications for next January. So if you uh, in the audience are a writer of any of our genres, please go to our website underthevolcano.org and check out the application guidelines. The deadline is September 15th for January. And um, the ORG means that we're a nonprofit organization. We give financial aid to people who need it based on talent and proof of need. And we also have a number of full fellowships for exceptionally gifted writers in different genres. The program is also bilingual. And if you or anyone you know would be a good candidate, please, please send them to our website. We'd love to read their work. Um, I want to really just turn to a final question now, which maybe is like the one on most people's minds by this point, which is so we've heard of the kinds of epiphanies that led to these two books, Survivor Cafe by Liz Rosner. I'm going to hold it up again. I hope it's not backwards. And Debbie Lascar's The Atlas of Reds and Blues, both, by the way, published by CounterPoint. And um, ask whether, yes, shout out to a very visionary publisher, um, ask where this has left you. I mean, I assume you're still writing. You haven't just packed it in. and. Um, this is a hard time to be writing in, but if there's anything you would each like to say about, you know, where you, where you see your current work or a current or recently finished product uh, project, this is the time. We'd love to hear anything either of you have to say, and this will be a kind of closing comment before we open the floor to questions. Yeah, well, I was gonna, um, I was gonna mention, um, as a kind of segue from what we were just talking about and Devi's comment about our books um, ideally leading to conversation and dialogue um, that in a way Survivor, Survivor Cafe ends with a kind of exhortation for us to, to find ways of telling our stories and, and to listen to one another um, even if it means listening to a story from a perpetrator, listening to um, the inheritance of abuse, neglect, trauma, violence. I mean, listening to uncomfortable things. And, and the book that I am trying to write and failing a lot right now because of a million distractions, including being a pretty much full-time caregiver to my 91-year-old father, is a book about listening and about the hard work of listening deeply. And, um, and I think that um, part of my challenge is to keep trusting that I'm writing even when I'm not writing, which has mostly been true for me in my life, even though I always get afraid that it's no longer true. It was true before, but it's no longer true but that, um, that I have to have faith that what I'm still doing is I'm absorbing and processing and thinking and feeling my way around the book and, and that when the time comes where I can really sit with the language of it and the images and the scenes and the pages of it, I will. But, but the questions that are haunting me right now are um, how do we listen deeply and what does it mean to listen deeply and who exemplifies that process and that practice and 
and what can we learn about how to do it better. So I am trying to write more nonfiction, in other words, um, and that's my subject. Oh, I can't wait to read it. <laughs> same here, same here, but no pressure. You know, <laughs> just believe that you're right, even when you're not right. I do believe that. I think it's true. Davi? Uh, so, yeah, I'm, you know, I am, um, I, I know it, it, it's been tough uh, during the pandemic, you know, to, to do anything but, you know, stay glued to the TV. Um, but um, I, I feel like um, the word writing, um, the writing practice uh, is more than just sitting down and writing. It, it is reading, it is touching your work in some way. It's thinking about it. I try to do a, a 10 minutes um, a, a day and that's my extremely low expectation. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, someone, uh, I, I recently taught a class and someone, you know, asked me, they're like, how did you finish? And I said, I literally, um, I literally just gave myself, I have to write a sentence and anything above the sentence is ice cream and cake and, and I'll take it. But, but my obligation to myself is the sentence. And so, you know, some sentences are three words long. <laughs> and, and so, um, so that's my, <laughs> that's, that was, that's how I sort of finished the thing that I, that I sort of took time out to do um, recently. It's, um, it's a very short novel. It's um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, task I gave myself uh, is that it had to be in second person. And so I just finished up with, excuse me? Any reason for that? Um, I was really interested. Um, one of my classmates, uh, one of your other students uh, was, is uh, Julie Atsuka and she wrote The Buddha in the Attic. That's first person plural. And I was just so entranced by that book. And I, I couldn't figure out how to do we, but I actually uh, tried to do you and I, I, really enjoyed it so um that's that's sort of what i'm trying to finish up right now it's this very short novel that's set in second person do we have a title that we can sure it's called circa um like uh, you know before the history of something is written it's circa you know 1945 or yeah wow. so fantastic Wow. Listen, I know we could go on and on. I personally could listen to both of you for ages, but we do have some very good questions coming along and I would like to weave them into this conversation. So uh, one of them has been slightly touched on, but someone named Ellen Commissar is, um, no, sorry, that's not right. Uh, Sarah Kobrinsky is asking how you dealt with your own fear, if any, as you told your stories. So, I mean, you've touched on different kinds of fear, but maybe mm. not directly head on as it's meant in this question. You know, I think the thing that um, that is my way of, of wrestling with almost all my fears about my writing is to um, is to really see how much of my ego I can set aside, not all of it, but most of it to say that um, to disidentify myself with the work as, you know, somehow the um, representation of me, but to say that I'm trying to bring something into the world that's going to have a life of its own if I'm lucky, and that that it's my job as the artist to enable that work to come into being, and that that I have to kind of allow that, allow myself to be the vessel for that or the this sounds so kind of ethereal in a way or magical, but that I'm, I'm transmitting something and that, um, that the less ego driven I am about the outcome and what it's going to bring me um, in terms of its acclaim or reception, but instead to think about just trying to do the best work I can and then to step out of the way. So is that empowering, emboldening, um, energizing? That's a follow. Yeah, I mean, no, paradoxically, even though it's very humble in a way, it's, it's very um, right-sizing of myself, it actually is deeply liberating because then I'm not so attached to the outcome. I'm really able to just be present to what happens. And and then the book is itself, not mine, you know, not this thing that I, big I, made. 
but a book that kind of made itself. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, there's uh, so much fear in it. I mean, as I said before, earlier on, it's a page turner and the woman is shot in her driveway and you're aware of that. So there's the, the presence of fear is huge. Yeah. What um, is that an I, issue I, for you? Yeah. I, you know, I have to say, you know, um, when I, um, you know, people have often described, um, you know, writing as being cathartic and I, I actually don't believe in catharsis. <laughs> um, I did not write this to feel better and I don't feel better having written it. Um, I am just super grateful I was able to write. And, um, and so um, I, I think the way I have dealt with um, the fear of, uh, you know, um, of how this will turn out. And, uh, you know, I'm a, I was a debut novelist at uh, 52. <laughs> so um, I had no expectations <laughs> of, you know, of anybody reading my book or, you know, doing anything with it. Um, and, um, and so it's all been a wonderful surprise, but um, I, I found that the one thing that has really helped me um, along the way is that, um, I have always tried to, as a poet, um, read my work aloud. Um, you know, uh, you know, I, I did study with, uh, besides studying with you, I studied with Lucille Clifton for, you know, those two years too. And she was such a big believer in oral tradition. And she always talked about how, you know, before there were recording devices, there was, you know, the campfire and people, you know, repeating their stories over and over again until a new generation could carry them forward. And I feel like a, a way that I overcame a lot of the fear um, uh, when I was writing this book was that I just kept reading it aloud to myself. Mm -hmm. And, and if it sounded right, then I felt better about leaving it in. And if it sounded mm -hmm. strange, or I was, um, you know, tripping over my words, and my tongue was, you know, stumbling, then it was an indication that perhaps I didn't have correct word choice, or maybe this wasn't the correct place for it. And, um, and I, you know, that's something that everyone can do who aspires to write something um, is that they can read their work to the, out loud to themselves. And it will, um, I think when you hear it and it sounds okay to you, you have to kind of trust your first instinct. And that's a way to go, I think. Very helpful. Nice advice for the writers out there. Um, we have another question. This is specifically for Elizabeth. Um, uh, let me just see this uh, from Christina Beecher, I think. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Um, could you describe how you use the word labyrinth as it pertains to memory? Um, thank you for that. Yeah, so the subtitle of my book was, you know, one of those things that I went around and around and around with, and I, you know, pages of lists of possible subtitles and and that word labyrinth, I think, um, finally felt so precisely right to me because the more I studied memory and the more I read um, research about how the brain works and, and how long-term and short-term memory function and um, or malfunction, I should say sometimes, that the image of this labyrinth of um, you know, I don't know if you've ever walked a labyrinth, which I have a number of times, and and this feeling of you think you're approaching, you think you're approaching the center, um, but actually then you have to make a turn that leads you farther away from the center, and then you think you're as far from the center as you could possibly be, and then suddenly you're at the center. And the way that memory functions, it turns out just as a shorthand, because I write a lot about it in the book, is that um, the more we retell a memory, the more we access a memory and then bring it back into language and, and share it, the more we rewrite it and modify it, even though intuitively you would think that the more you revisit a memory, the more you solidify it and the more you, you guarantee that you're keeping it, in fact, it's the opposite. And so it's, it's sort of this paradox that I wanted to get at um, that a labyrinth, re a labyrinth represents, but it also 
to me, it's also just this gorgeous visual that it looks like a brain. It looks like the right. folds and intricacies of a brain as well. And, and that it's mysterious as memory is and as the brain is. Bien. Well, we have another question here that um, might or might not turn into a labyrinth itself in the answers. And that is asking about the recent controversy around the book American Dirt by Janine Cummins. I'm sure you've both heard about it. And essentially that hinges around the question of who gets to tell a given story. So appropriation, et cetera, et cetera. Anybody wanna take a stab at that? I, I can tell you that, you know, the way it's not steering away from the question when I say this, but I do feel like, um, in a way, to me, the more interesting question isn't who gets to tell a given story. It's more how do you tell a story respectfully and deferentially and, and authentically? And that doesn't mean you can't, as I've been talking about for this whole hour, you know, reaching outside your own safe territory, let's say, and daring to enter the territory that's unfamiliar and that isn't specifically maybe your given material, the willingness to be humble in the face of what you don't know and the willingness to, um, to listen, to use that word again, that is, you know, so, so important to me and always has been. So I think that, um, that it's not that I'm trying to say your question isn't the right question, but, but it's, it's not the way I like to ask it. I like to ask the question of how can you tell a story well and, and, and do it, do it honor, do the material honor. And that's, that's more my answering a question with a question. Debbie, I, I, would, yeah. I, I would tend to I, I tend to agree. Um, I think anyone can write about anything. I think um, you know people like Salman Rushdie and Taslima Nasrin have paid for that, right? And so so we get to write whatever we want, but yes, we have to write with um, you know and give our our characters dignity, right? And um, and uh, respect and injustice right and so um you know uh, i have not read the book but um and i don't plan to but i i understand that you know i think there was some uh, question about some of the stereotypes of you know what was of being portrayed which kind of goes to the dignity bucket right and the respect bucket where you know if if you're you want to explore what you don't know about what you know, right? So you um, want to give it as much of your, um, uh, you know, respect and um, attention and time uh, as you can. I think that I think that it also comes back to a question of integrity as a writer, and right. you know, Devi has experience in journalism, and and journalists really have to take responsibility for getting the facts right and and standing by their work and and making apologies when they got it wrong, and but really doing their doing their legwork and their background check and all of that, and I think that just because you're writing fiction doesn't give you permission to take shortcuts and, and to, Correct. you know, to just take the easy way out because you feel like it or to just abbreviate something because you, you know, oh, I can just look it up online and, and go with your first source. Like that's laziness. Writers have to have more integrity than that. I mean, if you're a serious writer, take your work seriously. And that includes your research and that includes, um, standing behind what you write because you've you've worked at it and you know and and you know every one of us who is a serious writer we have over the years um formed uh, a, some kind of community right so we're not writing in a vacuum and we have we have excellent 
ears and, uh, you know, and eyes around us and they are listening and they are reading our work and they are telling us when we're getting something wrong. Mm -hmm. And we also have ears and eyes and we are listening to their words of advice because they're not doing it you know, they're doing it because they want to save us the embarrassment or the, you know, having to issue an apology or a retraction. They would prefer, just like we would prefer as the writers, to get it right. And to get it right means, yeah, even in a work of fiction, there is plenty to research, you know, there is plenty to research. Yeah. And so why not? Why not spend the extra six months in research, right? Mis hermanas, I can't thank you enough for this inspiring conversation. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave off here, but I do want to say um, you've answered that question so well, so deeply. And I think I'm just giving a plug here for Under the Volcano. We are not a program that is going to encourage anyone to walk on eggshells. We want our writers to take risks, but we want them to do that with care and empathy and dignity. And I think both Liz and Debbie embody that attitude in their work and we'll be thrilled to bring them back to you. We're going to have to leave it here, but I do want to say also that we're on a roar of a campaign to raise money for scholarships. We're a nonprofit and if anyone here has extra cash jangling in their pocket or their bank account, we have scholarships to award and here you go. Our wonderful webmaster has pulled up this screen. There's a lot of different ways you can contribute to Under the Volcano. All the links are on the support page on our web page. And um, we have all of these great newfangled everything platforms, Zelle, PayPal, Venmo. You can even send us a check. It's all on the website. And again, please um, send us candidates for the workshops. We'll be doing Words of Witness, a community of the imagination in the realm of the virtual most of the month of January 2021. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Applause. (laughs) Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Magda. Thank you, Magda. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you, Debbie. Wonderful to see you. you. It was great to see you all.